On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and I'm very excited to welcome Chef Fernando Peralto. How are you today? Hi, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm all right. How are you feeling? Good, very good. I'm getting ready for the cool weather, like you said. Uh, get your your biking habits are going to be a little altered for a second here yeah. while it gets cooler weather. But we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about because, as I was uh, mentioning, I had just interviewed Kim Campbell, mm -hmm. and we had our ten day immersion and how you literally took the potatoes. <laughs> I made these mashed potatoes the day after I got home. Well, we will share that in a minute and how that means so much to me. We'll, we'll get there, but uh, I will tell you guys, this is going to be quite a treat for not only your ears, but your taste buds. If you listen to a few things, I'm sure chef's going to teach us today, but can you tell us a little bit about your experience on the plant-based, how you, well, first you didn't even start out in, in culinary. Just tell us about who is Chef Fernando. Oh, uh, well, Lori, uh, I actually have a background in finance. So I, I started my professional life in, uh, in finance uh, and I worked in finance for about 20 years. And that's how I came to America. I started in Brazil when I got transferred uh, to, to work here in the United States in finance planning and analysis for a company called Unisys Corporation. Um, but after a while, I, I just didn't want to be in corporate anymore. I didn't enjoy uh, my job and I decided to, that I wanted to do something else. And I always enjoyed cooking. And, uh, and I decided that I wanted to do that professionally. And I already was targeting working with um, plant-based products. So at, at that point, I had been vegetarian um, for a few years. I, I turned vegetarian after my dad had a quadruple bypass. Uh, and he's still alive and uh, it all went well, but it was a wake up call, you know, when you realize that your, your blood indicators and the, the family history um, is, is, not, is not very good. So, so I thought that going vegetarian was an important step. And, and now I realize there was a, a lot more, you know, to, to vegetarianism now that we know all, all we know about cheese and dairy and, and eggs. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went to cooking school, it was a, it was a traditional cooking school. It was a French style where I, I had to work with, uh, with uh, meat and fish and poultry and all that. Um, but, but my goal was really to, to learn the techniques so that I could later apply those techniques to, to vegan cooking. So, so that, was, that was the focus. So I did a, I did a Cordon Bleu um, program in Pittsburgh. And then uh, I went to work for a few restaurants. I wanted to be ready before I tried to open my own. So I worked at five restaurants after the cooking school. And then, uh, and then I opened a, a plant-based, it was entirely vegan restaurant uh, right outside Philly. Um, and then I came across uh, the, the Whole Foods plant-based community and I learned about Whole Foods plant-based. And my restaurant was already uh, healthier than average. We didn't fry anything. Everything was baked, but I did use oils. Um, mm -hmm. And when I came across the Whole Foods plant-based community, I made a complete transition uh, to the restaurant to, to be entirely Whole Foods plant-based. Um, wow. and, and that's what it was for, um, you know, first restaurant I had for five years and the second for two. So wow. for, seven, for about uh, at least five, six years, I, I had a restaurant that was entirely uh, Whole Foods plant-based. Wow. And so what were some of the favorite foods or recipes or meals that people liked when they'd come into your restaurant? Uh, so it was quick, uh, was quick service. Uh, okay. So it was sandwiches and bowls and wraps and salads. Um, the soups were very popular uh, and it's, it's very easy to make plant-based soups because a lot of the soups are plant-based by nature, right? So we make mm -hmm. beans, we make lentils and we're making, I don't know, a ginger carrot, uh, pumpkin, you know, all of that stuff is already plant-based, so it's not that complicated. So that's not, that is something that people don't, don't, don't feel unfamiliar to. They understand those soups already, right? Uh, and, so, and some of the sandwiches, we try to, to emulate some of the traditional sandwiches. So we had a Reuben that was very popular. Um, and in the beginning, my, my Reuben had, a, for example, a vegan cheese, and eventually I transitioned to a, um, I was using avocados instead of the cheese. And it was very interesting. And, you know, so I had the avocado and the coleslaw and then we're using seitan and soy curls as a protein. And, uh, and of course, the Thousand Island uh, 
dressing. It, it, it was very popular. I had a cheesesteak because, of course, it's Philadelphia, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I had a falafel that was very popular. So, so a lot of a lot of things that were already familiar to people, uh, just that we made uh, initially plant based and later whole foods plant based. I'm just hungry listening to you rattle off all these because I've I came home and I was I was quite excited for a few days because mm -hmm. I didn't get to enjoy years cooking with Kim and oh my goodness just the the camaraderie and everyone but okay so we got to dive into we'll just do I have to tell the this potato story because I, I want you to understand <laughs> I grew up eating beans and potatoes like that was the vegetables beans potato like because we were didn't have money. Yeah. We had potatoes, more potatoes and more potatoes. Like every day there were potatoes. And so we made potatoes, but we put in butter and, you know, salt and pepper. That was like the base and some milk. That was how we made it. And they were always creamy, delicious. And then when you go plant-based for me, I just, you know, left out the butter, put in some, you know, plant-based milk and some salt and pepper. <laughs> they were yeah. just kind of like this sad little watery down, not quite as fluffy, creamy potatoes, but you know, it is what it is. And the potatoes just kind of drifted out of our life. We'd eat them on Thanksgiving and occasion. I'll make some more. But then we're at this 10-day immersion. Fernando <laughs> makes these mashed potatoes. I'm like, what's going on? Because <laughs> I know there's no butter. And I know there's no, what's going on here? Because I was like, if I can have potatoes like this, my life will be complete, Fernando. It's been a decade since I've had creamy potatoes. So I try like freaking out about these things. So I'm like uh -huh. asking Fernando, how did you make these? He's like, well, I don't know. I just throw in some things. I'm like, you guys kill me. Those that just put things together. But what was it? It was tell me, tell us what made these so. As I made them read again at home with what you told me, and, it, and it's worked. And I'm, I'm so ever eternally grateful. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs> Bring potatoes back to my life. But please tell me, tell everyone how to do this. It's delicious whole food creamy potatoes. Well, well, well. So, so, so the, the longer answer is you always try to balance, right? You always try to balance the sour, the sweet, the, the salty, and what we call umami, right? So you always try to balance the flavors. And, uh, and you, you start learning things as you go. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, when we use cashew cream as a replacement, the cashew cream is a little sweeter. So then you balance with a little bit of salt and a little bit of sour just to, to bring it back to what, uh, to what a, a cream would be. Because sometimes they make mashed potatoes with cream at restaurants, right? Sometimes they use cream, sometimes they just use a lot of butter and milk, which is pretty much cream, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a little salt and uh, sometimes garlic and all that stuff. So, so the mashed potatoes that I made, uh, we made a, a cashew cream, uh, and the cashew cream is uh, cashews. Um, the ratio is about one to one and a half or one to two, depending on, on how thick you want the, uh, the cashew cream to be. So one cup of cashews and about a cup and a half to two cups of, uh, of water. Uh, and, and you season with uh, salt. I use uh, Dijon mustard, uh, maybe a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, uh, maybe one or two garlic cloves. It, 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 could, be, it could be roasted or not. Uh, by the time you blend, it doesn't really matter if, if it was roasted. It probably tastes a little better if you roast it before, but you don't need to. Um, and, uh, and a bit of salt. And, you know, there, there's really not that much to it. Um, if you like other flavors, for example, if you want to give a, a little bit of rosemary, a little bit of thyme, it, it kind of takes your mind to that holiday spirit. That there's always that thyme and rosemary mm -hmm. kind of kind of background flavor to the food. Uh, so you know you you can do a, you can do that. You can do a little sprinkle of rosemary and thyme, and it's going to give a special flavor to the potato. So you just cook the pocket potatoes thoroughly. And, uh, and you mash with the, with the cashew creams and you taste it. You see if the consistency is right. You see if it needs a little bit more salt. Um, if, if, it is, uh, if it is too much, uh, too much cream, don't use it all. If you're missing a little cream, you can make some more. You can just use a little milk. Mm. Plant-based milk. Yes, plant-based milk. Um, I'll tell you, I get off the plane. Like, I told my husband, like, we're making these mashed potatoes. <laughs> So, but the cool thing was I never would have thought of adding like a mustard and you also mentioned nutritional yeast, but I put mm -hmm. in time, I love thyme, right. rosemary, yeah. um, but I would have never, I don't even know why I didn't think about adding in the cashew cream because I've used it in soups and things. I, I yeah. It was just, it blew my mind. Like I was like, ah, <laughs> so, oh, we could, there's so many things we can talk about. So what is, 
when you said the context of soups and these are easy, you know, I feel like we're entering into that winter season. What are some of the easy soups that are for people who are just starting this way or they can add to the repertoire that, you know, things that maybe they already have at home or ones that you've seen people enjoy? Like what are those, those soups? Yeah. Um, look, uh, uh, man, there's so many that you can make, right? And, and they're pretty easy, right? You can make you can make tomato soup. Uh, you, you can make with canned tomatoes. You can make with tomatoes uh, uh, tomatoes puree, uh, which is pretty much dry tomatoes, right? What they mm. do when they puree and make those uh, those heavy, um, they they dry the tomatoes and then they puree the the dry tomatoes. So so you can use that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so you can make a tomato soup. Uh, you, you, you can make it a little creamier using the cashews. Uh, mm. If you don't want to use cashews to cream, you can use uh, white beans or you can use uh, cauliflower like we did uh, in the immersion as well. Um, or you can use um, tofu. You know, you mm. can just, uh, just uh, beat the, the tofu in the, in the blender. So, so there, there's many ways to cream a soup. It doesn't have to be cashews because they are a bit expensive and some people are allergic to it. Uh, if you happen to have an Indian store where you live, go check out there because usually the cashews are cheaper there. Mm. So they, they sell broken cashews at the Indian stores and you may be able to, to find uh, um, cashews for, for, less, uh, for less money in those places. Oh, wow. So, so, so going back to the soups, you, 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 can make a, you can make tomato, you can make a ginger carrot, uh, you can make uh, beans, you can make uh, lentils. Um, you can make cauliflower, you can make broccoli. Um, and, and usually I think the ratio that they, they give you if you're making a vegetable soup, it's about a pound of vegetable to a quart of liquid. Mm, okay. uh, and it, you're not gonna use a quart of cream, that's gonna be way too heavy. So if you're, if you're making it, let's say a broccoli soup, you can start with a pound of broccoli um, and maybe three cups uh, of water and one cup of cream. So, oh, okay. so that will be so that will be about a quart of liquid uh, for for a pound of broccoli, and okay. then you can season with just garlic, onions, and, and salt a, as the basics. And if you like other flavors like dill and other herbs, you can add it too. So it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't need to have a lot of ingredients. You can, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I knew a chef that used to tell me that when you over season the vegetables, you don't taste them. So when you cook with vegetables, you don't have to season as much you know, mm -hmm. using 15 different spices because then you don't taste the broccoli in the soup anymore. You're just tasting spices, right? Mm. So for those who are coming from a standard American diet, are there particular foods that you found helpful for the transition or taste to focus in on or spices for folks who are trying to, used to being having their taste buds hijacked basically. Any ideas on, on those type of things for people kind of transitioning? Um, I think people crave the, the texture of meats. I think that that's something that I usually see, right? So people mm -hmm. often look for, for meat substitutes. Um, the lentil burgers that we worked with, uh, we can also make uh, meatballs out of those. Uh, I know that Kim has a recipe for, uh, for meatballs as well. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly, you can go online and find a hundred recipes for meatballs and, uh, and burgers. Um, Try the soy curls because I, I think it's a great product. It's a clean product. It's out of California. I have no relationship with that company, but it's a company mm -hmm. called Butler Foods. Uh, and they, they sell it online. I don't think you can buy it at retail. You have to buy online, mm -hmm. but they are on Amazon. So it's called soy curls. Um, I like seitan. People may think that it's not a whole foods plant based because it, you rinse the, the, the flour. So you take some of, the, some of the nutrition out of the flour as you rinse. But it's also a product that doesn't have added oils and, uh, and it's relatively clean. And if you don't have a problem with gluten, I think mm -hmm. seitan could be a, a substitute if, you, if you're transitioning. Um, a lot of the other stuff in the market is really you know, not healthy. So it's, uh, I guess, you know, if you're desperate, if, if the option is that or Burger King and have a Whopper, I guess you may want to have the Impossible Whopper. But sure. I don't think it's something that we recommend that people People go by the impossibles and the and the beyonds. So, and you had also mentioned because I feel like um, a lot of people are just like they're just like, oh, I'm just going to eat rabbit food when I transition to this plant based diet. But you mentioned balancing all these different flavors. Could you just kind of explain what those are and kind of how can someone who's not doesn't have culinary training how we can 
go about figuring out how to know when a recipe is missing something. Cause I feel like that's the one thing I kept seeing you and Kim would do. And she would often defer to you as like, oh, you try something. It's like, oh, it needs a little of this. Like, can you help us kind of learn how to focus in on what our taste buds are telling us? Because that is just a talent that's just like a mystical power to me. <laughs> um, I, I, look, Laurie, it's one of those things that uh, I think <laughs> that we say we know it when we see it, right? But, um, but, but really, when you taste something, um, I, I think I told you it's not a secret. I'm a little, I have an addiction to salt. So I'm, I'm working on that. Oh, we, 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 we talked a lot about your salt my, <laughs> my blood pressure is down. I'm working on it. I'm using a lot right. less salt. But, but often when you can't taste anything in the food, it's probably missing a little bit of salt. So if you mm. taste food and it's completely bland, that's probably a starting point. It's, it has way too little salt. So, that, so that's a starting point. So without going crazy, just going small increments and, and putting, you know, one eighth of a, of a teaspoon, one quarter of a teaspoon, and then going small quantities, adjusting the recipe. Um, herbs are good too, but most people won't have fresh herbs at home. So there's things like fresh parsley, fresh basil, fresh cilantro, fresh uh, thyme and rosemary, those things that have a tremendous amount of flavor. Uh, next best, best thing is dried herbs. Uh, they, they also add flavor to the food. Uh, you can buy vegetable stocks like, uh, like we use over there. I mean, there's, there's a couple of brands that are not terrible in terms of the amount of salt that they have. So th there are vegetable stocks that you can use in everything from the soups to you know, even sauteing, you can add a little bit of vegetable stock because that will have what we call the umaminess. So they will have uh, the umaminess that comes sometimes from just the, the roasting the vegetables, just that caramelization that happens when you roast the vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, tomato paste has that. It has that uh, once, you, once you cook the tomato paste and you brown the tomato paste, mm -hmm. it sweetens. So it has that depth to the, to the flavor. Um, Sour is a little more tricky if, because it's, it's impossible to take it out. So if you put too much, uh, too much vinegar, you can't, you can't disguise it. So mm -hmm. if you try to balance the sour, I use a lot of lemon juice and, and lime juice. Uh, I think it's a little more mild than vinegar, um, but you can use vinegar. You can use balsamic, again, in small increments. Uh, and you have to taste it. You, you have to find whatever is comfortable for you. Um, mm -hmm. But just don't go, don't eat bland because you think it has to be bland. You know, you experiment. And, and, and every chef will tell you that nothing comes perfect the first time. So you gotta have a little mm -hmm. patience too. As you, as you venture into the kitchen, you know, nothing ever is gonna come perfect the first time you make it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, try, try to balance. And, and you will notice, for example, when, you, when you're eating meats and, and, um, and dairy, uh, they have a natural sweetness to it. You know, uh, if you eat meat without any salt, it's a little sweet. And the mm -hmm. same with the, the same with uh, milk and, and, and cream and things like that. So that's why sometimes you add a little bit of sugar uh, to a savory di uh, dish just to just to compose. So so it, so it breaks a little the tart, it breaks a little the salt, and just composes the flavor. Hmm. So what do you use for sweet and whole food uh, plant based cooking? Um, I I use uh, maple syrup. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm out of maple syrup, I use a, a brown sugar, one of those, uh, one of those Costco sugar cane brown sugar. Gotcha. And then, so what are some of your favorite meals that you eat at home? Well, you're from Brazil and your wife is from Colombia. So yeah. <clears throat> South Africa or South Africa, South American culture and flavor. So what, is, yeah. what are the things that you guys cook at home that you enjoy? Um, so, so there's a there's a dish in Brazil that is called moqueca. Uh, it, it's it's very much like the Thai dishes. It's a casserole. Okay. Uh, it's traditionally made with seafood. So I make uh, I make with uh, mushrooms. So I try to get different types of mushrooms, and um, and you just it's a stew, and I and I add a few vegetables to it. So I add peppers and onions and garlic and and a lot of mushrooms. Um, and, uh, and it has a cilantro and it has a coconut milk base. Mm. So it's a very intense flavor. So very deep and intense because there's so many things happening there between the cilantro and the, and the coconut milk. So it's a little sweet, but it's also, uh, I don't even know how to explain cilantro for those who like cilantro, right? Uh, it, it has a little tartness to it, but it's also pungent. Um, mm. so, so that is one, uh, we eat a lot of beans, uh, we eat a lot of lentils. 
uh, there's a Colombian potato soup that is called ajiaco, uh, which is potato, mostly potatoes. It also has corn. I use soy curls in there. And it has a herb that is impossible to find in America called guasca. And without that herb, it's just a potato soup. It's just a very particular flavor. Um, so things like that. But, um, but I, I, frankly, I, I, I try to keep simple. You know, not, not every day is Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I'd like to talk also about your, your cookbook that you have, the easiest plant-based recipe book ever, which is a fantastic title. First of all, what was the prompt to write this book? And then tell us about it. Like, what are we going to find in the pages, which I've already ordered too, by the way. So it's on my, it's way to my house. So tell me, um, what am I going to find uh, in the, in between these pages? <laughs> Well, Kim, uh, Kim, uh, Laurie, <laughs> I think that's a compliment. <laughs> no, uh, Mari, um, I have a bunch of uh, cookbooks, and I think every chef has a gazillion cookbooks at home. Um, mm. We we steal ideas and we look, uh, you know, for for what's out there. Um, but when I go through those recipes, um, they're just unrealistic for the home cook. You know, I, I go through through. Uh, a lot of recipes that those guys are never going to have the ingredients at home. It's just you open a cookbook, say, I, I could never cook that. I, I can't even pronounce some yeah. of those ingredients. So I, I wanted to write a book that was simple enough that anybody could cook anything in half an hour. That, that was my goal. You know, my, my vision was you get home from work and you look through your pantry. And what can I do if I have a can of chickpeas and I have a half an onion and I have a piece of a, a pepper and I have some garlic? What can I put together with what I have? Or if I go buy, you know, can, what can I buy as a basic list, you know, as a basic pantry list that, uh, that I can use for a lot of different things? Um, mm -hmm. so, so that was my vision, was really, you know, keeping, keeping it simple. I, you know, I, I, I had that vision in mind of uh, simplicity and, and efficiency. So, for mm -hmm. example, when I got home from, from work um, and I was going to make a pasta, right? So I had that vision that, uh, okay, so I get home, I, I put water to boil before I go change into my pajamas. And um, <laughs> while the water is boiling, I change when I get downstairs again, I put the pasta in the water it boils for 10 minutes or so. In those 10 minutes, I'm cutting the vegetables. Once the, the pasta is cooked, I drain it. I use the same pot to cook the vegetables, mix the sauce, put the pasta back, and the meal is ready. So I had wow. that vision that, no, it's serious, but I, I had that vision that people could do things like that without being overwhelmed because nobody wants to be in the kitchen for two hours after they are worked, right? So, mm -hmm. so that was the idea. That was the, the idea was simplicity. I think that's one of the reasons I put a I put the pasta on the on the front of the, uh, of the book is because that was one of the simplest things you could do. You can make pasta with a, with a tomato sauce with some vegetables in the tomato sauce, uh, and if you want to add soy curls to the vegetables, but it, but it's something. And that is uh, that, that sauce is a little creamy with uh, with cashew cream. But uh, but that is something that anybody can make in half an hour. Mm. That is brilliant. So what are some of your recipes and what are some of the, are there any techniques, like you said, that putting the water on the boil while you're going to go change? I mean, that just makes a lot of sense. What yeah. are some of those steps where you're seeing cutting out? Like, is it where things are placed in the kitchen? Is it certain things, like you said, having available, like the basics of your pantry? Like, what are some of those things that are highlighted or we should highlight in the book too that are going to be time saving that you've mentioned that's just so important and, and simple. <laughs> well, I think yes, having a pantry is important. So if, if you have some basics always at home, so if you open my fridge, there's always going to be onions, there's always going to be peppers, uh, probably garlic, and I may have spinach, I may have uh, tomatoes. So, so there's always a basic amount of vegetables that you have that you can make a lot of things with. Um, you, you may want to have some canned beans, you may want to have some canned chickpeas, you may want to have frozen peas and frozen corn. Um, you know, all of those things are practical to have and you can put together if you want to make a quick stew, if you want to make a quick uh, stir fry, you know, you can use your leftovers. If you have leftover rice, it can become, you know, a stir fried rice uh, the next day with some uh, tofu scramble and vegetables to just make it into something else. 
Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the techniques, one of the things that I like to do that I find that efficient is using the oven as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So, so when, I'm, when I'm roasting vegetables, so whether I'm roasting onions and peppers, you know, simple things, um, or even corn, I, I like to roast in the oven because once you put that thing in the oven for 15 or 20 minutes, you can go do something else and not babysitting the pan. So it's mm -hmm. also that frees you up to either go make a sauce or you go find what you're gonna watch on Netflix, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are the things that help me. It's, uh, it's having things readily available, things that are easy to, to, to cook with. Um, I, I like pasta, I eat a lot of pasta. So I always have a whole wheat pasta at home. Uh, I like polenta, so I, I often have polenta and polenta it takes a while to cook. So uh, mm -hmm. it will take you 20, 30 minutes to, to cook. So, so that is something that you have to do a little bit in advance, uh, but then you cook a bunch of it and then you put it in the oven. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, uh, what you have available, uh, don't, don't bother buying a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, what do you call it? appliances because you're not going to use them you, you know if you want to have an air fryer or a good oven that's all you need uh the mixer you're probably gonna not going to use uh, that much maybe a food mm -hmm. processor if you like uh, but a good blender will replace a food processor for a lot of things so mm -hmm. you know don't don't uh, overload your your <laughs> your counter space uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and the one thing that i'm obsessed with is having a big cutting board i go crazy if i have a small cutting board you're also you're a tall guy too, so it makes sense. We talked about the height of cabinets, and you're six three, yeah. right? Yeah. So I was like, I was like, felt so bad here, just like, <laughs> it's like way down here. So, so let's get back to um, also you mentioned. I love the simplicity also of just like a big cutting board is important. Like I I have an Instapot, but honestly, I've only used it a few times because it kind of freaked me out the whole steam thing. My mother, grandmother was burnt by the old pressure cookers that used to have that popped off and oh yeah but ever since then it's like this ptsd with me and steam but <laughs> um but the blender i use a lot more than my food processor i have one but um yeah. and sharp knives right how can someone keep knives sharp like what what is the secret there do you do your own sharpening do you have a someone else do it uh i sharpen myself um i i have um I have a, a, what do you call it? It's like a sharpening stone. Mm -hmm. And I also have a, what they call a, a honing iron. So you just, uh, it's just to keep it sharp. So once it's sharp, you use that little big steel, um, I think they, they call it honing, uh, honing. It's the round thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. that is just to keep it, it's not for sharpening, it's just for keeping it sharp. It just takes the edge of it. Um, mm -hmm. Try to keep your knives dry. So after you finish using it, you just uh, you can rinse it, but but dry it right away. You know, with a mm. with your kitchen towel, because okay. it's it's also the rust that that, that causes it to to go uh, to go dull. And and it's true. I mean, there's nothing more irritating than a, <laughs> a dull knife. It's horrible to work with. Uh, so do you sharpen after, or do you use the uh, the stone like after every? use or doing not, not how, how often one, no it will probably it will probably last you a week or so or maybe, okay. maybe a little longer um you know i don't try this at home but i i, I test it with my fingers and i you oh know, my I goodness just, I, I check if the knife is uh you know if you go against no no not you know don't don't run it you know you go against the blade and you can tell if it is sharp enough but uh, so yeah, sure, sure, sure. yeah sorry about that <laughs> But yeah, I, I check it before I, I go cut because because when you go cut a tomato and the knife is dull, it, it's just uh, yeah. it's, it's really annoying. That is actually one of my saddest moments. Like when you go and you're like, yeah, and then it's like I'm like because I have there's other people in the house that use right. everything I have. So so speaking of cutting boards, do you have a preference of the type of material that a cutting board should be? Is what should we be looking for? Mm, I, I use regular plastic. Um, okay. You know, it, it, at restaurants uh, we're not allowed to use wood because you, ah. wood is, is is known to be a, a porous material. Mm -hmm. So for sanitation purposes, they don't want you to have wood um, uh. because it, it doesn't rinse as well as the plastic. Um, okay. But um, no, I use regular plastic. So it's a regular, um, you know, maybe eighteen inches or maybe maybe twenty inches. So we don't need the fancy bamboo wooden. You really don't. I mean, I mean, if you you can buy it for the for the looks, but uh, mm -hmm. but you really don't need to. No. It does look nice. I will say the big wooden cutting boards. 
Yeah, no, they do look cool. They do look cool. I mean, <laughs> in, 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 in professional kitchens, you only see wood for, um, for baking. So ah. for, for the dough, for, for, you know, spreading the dough or, or rolling the dough, that's the only place you're going to see wood. Everything oh. else would be stainless steel or plastic. Interesting. I do want, you mentioned earlier roasting um, vegetables. Yeah. What is your, how do you make them crispy? Like, do you put anything on them and what temperature? And you said 15 minutes or so. Could you walk us through how to never fail at roasting vegetables? <laughs> Yeah, I feel that's I mean, a ma it's a major fail in my life. <laughs> well, some so vegetables are more forgiving than others, right? So mm. if, you, if you're roasting peppers and onions, it's hard to mess it up. Um, they, they are very forgiving. So if you just mm -hmm. cut them up and you may season them before spreading on the, on the pan. Um, one of the things, spread as well as you can, because if, you, if they're piled up, whatever is underneath is not going to get roasted. So spread as well as you can. Um, most vegetables will roast, roast in about 20 minutes at, at, at 350 okay. or 325. Okay. Uh, if you want them crispy, you may want to increase the temperature and reduce the, reduce the timing. So if you're mm. roasting a cauliflower uh, and you want that cauliflower crispy, you can do maybe 15 minutes at uh, 400. Um, okay. But you can, also, you can also coat them with a little bit of uh, whole wheat flour. So you, you oh. can toss it. You can toss it on, on, on milk and season milk, the plant-based milk. You, you can just uh, wet the vegetables on plant-based milk and, de and then toss on flour. And that will okay. give you that crust on the outside. So again, with the cauliflower, if you want to give a little coating of flour uh, you know, around it, then you can, you can bake it and get it a little more crispy. Hmm. What about like Brussels sprouts? Because I know a lot of because they're a little denser. And so sometimes they come out soggy. And what do you do for like Brussels well, sprouts? Those, those uh, just like I, I was, uh, was talking to a, a chef that I know we were talking the other day about uh, eggplant. So mm. he's from Israel. So for him, for him Israel is the uh, eggplant is the most common thing. And I'm saying, look, I, I am tired of eating bad eggplant. People just mm. don't want to cook it. It's one of the hardest vegetables to cook. Uh, and it's kind of similar to the Brussels sprout, sprout in that sense. Uh, those just cook longer, you know, cook mm. longer at lower temperature. So to be safe, bring it down to 300 and cook it for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, because it, it takes a while. And, you know, part of the issue is that the, the eggplants are not ripe. Uh, the Brussels sprouts, the, the issue is that they're dense. Mm -hmm. um, cook them longer, because if you, if you reduce the temperature, it's going to cook a little more from the inside out. Ah, and so they won't the burn on the outside and right. still stay soggy on the yeah. lower temperature. So, so bring it down to 300 and, and cook for maybe 40 minutes and it should be good. And you can, you can also toss with, uh, uh, if you like balsamic vinegar, if you mm -hmm. wet the, the inside of the Brussels sprout. So if it's cut in half and you toss it with, uh, with a little balsamic vinegar, that moist will also help it cook inside. Hmm. Okay. That sounds excellent. So what, how did you cook the eggplant? If you were to have an eggplant, what would you do or what would you well, you, you suggest? Can cook, you can cook on slices either way. Uh, don't okay. make it too thick. Maybe, you know, finger, uh, finger size uh, cuts and um, you can brush it also with seasoning. So, so you can, you can make a mix. Um, let's say that you can do, for example, the balsamic vinegar. And you okay. can use a little bit of the um, maple syrup just for, for a little sweetness and maybe some, um, uh, maybe some Dijon vinegar, salt and pepper, garlic powder. Uh, okay. And you can brush them because that moist is gonna help, uh, is gonna help cook a little better. Like we did with the um, with, um, squash that you mm. have. We, we brushed the squash with a little bit of, uh, of a coating of seasoning. Um, the, the balsamic vinegar is going to be wet enough and then the, the maple syrup is going to help it hold in place because if it is too liquid, it's going to fall off. So you can bring uh, the, the texture of the, of the maple syrup is going to help stay on top of the eggplant. So just mm. brush it a little bit, that moist is going to help. And then, and then let it cook longer, like maybe 40, 45 minutes at 300. And keep a look at it. You know, after, after half an hour, start looking. If it starts looking very dark it's done okay that, that's that's true don't forget about it <laughs> i mean uh, well because not every oven is the same right until you get right. familiar with your oven 
because sometimes 350 is not really 350. And, and mm -hmm. if you have a fan, if it is a convection oven, it will cook differently from, from a toaster oven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just because you have 350 there, not all of them are the same. And at different uh, elevations, because I know yeah. it cooks different up here in Colorado than some yeah. other places. So there's so much more I want to ask. So real, how did we move into kind of desserts and sweetness? Because then I feel like people, so there's the savory crowd who likes yeah. the meat and the barbecue, well, barbecue could be sweet, but that type of crowd, you know, the potato chips dips guys. But then there's like those who really miss and they're like struggling with the sweet side. How do they, how would you start thinking about desserts and sweet quote unquote treats on a whole food plant-based diet, where would someone begin you think, or what would be a good starting point? Cause that's a big one. Well, a good starting point is, uh, is Kim's uh, sweet potato pie, right? That, that was awesome. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, mm. so, so those are good starting points. You know, but now it's pumpkin season, you know, don't, don't just carve the pumpkin, eat, eat the mm -hmm. pumpkin. You can, make a, you can make it like she did. We can, we, you can blend it with chocolate and a little bit of maple, maple syrup and it's gonna be a nice pie filling. Or you can just bake it with the regular, you know, cinnamon and, and nutmeg, you know, the usual and, and some uh, vanilla, and you have mm -hmm. that, that that basic pie filling. Um, so so that is a good start. You can start with the with the squashes and and pumpkins. Um, avocados are great because they have that, that nice texture, right? Where you can make a you can make a chocolate mousse out of avocados. Mm -hmm. um, same with tofu, but but use the silken tofu, not not the regular tofu. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a bit of difference on the on the flavor. So when you use the when you're making sauces uh, and, and dressings, uh, mayo, uh, the silken has a lot less aftertaste uh, in your mouth mm -hmm. than the regular tofu. And, okay. and, and I don't really know the chemistry behind it, but the silken tofu will be much better for making like a chocolate mousse. You can you can do it with silken tofu, uh, or you can do it with cashew cream. Um, but, uh, but that's what you usually get in, in the desserts, right? You get some richness from, from the fats, so you can get it in the avocado, you can get it in the, uh, in the cashew. Um, and then you, you add the sweetness, you know, obviously you don't go crazy with it, but, but you, mm -hmm. you add a little, uh, uh, maple syrup to it. And if you like chocolate, you use chocolate. If you don't like chocolate, you have, you know, vanilla, nutmeg, cinnamon, a lot of, a lot of things to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fruits, right? Uh, the, there's a lot that you can do with the fruits. You know, mm -hmm. the pineapples is so are so sweet naturally that uh, that you can make a, a pineapple pie filling. Um, pineapple you know. pie? How would you? What would you put in your pineapple pie filling? That oh, I'm, I'm just thinking. You know, it, it, it <laughs> just came to my mind. I actually have to. This have is to the whole ten here. days I had with you. I was like, oh, I just added this. <laughs> No, I'm gonna have to try to do it now because because uh, I would use a little cinnamon and a little nutmeg okay. on my pineapple, and mm. um, and just um, some cornstarch and make it into a into a filling. Wow! Um, or even mix it like frozen, yeah. different things. Yeah, you huh. know there, there are some things that you can do. You know, I I did a um, um, I did a jelly and I didn't want to make it too sweet. So to get the texture that you normally get from from a from a jam. Um, I was using, this time I used xanthan gum, but there's other things that you can use. You can use guar gum, you can use um, chia seeds, and mm. you, can, you can blend uh, some of that and then add to, the, add to the pineapple in the pot and you cook it and you don't have to use as much sugar as you normally would, would get in a, in a jelly. Mm. Mm. Ah, that sounds so good. <laughs> Okay, so now I've got, now the other thing is tofu, right? So some people have never had tofu. And then some who've used tofu, like you said, some of the, you're just so disappointed with tofu in restaurants. How do, how can we use tofu to bring the flavor? Like, how should we cook it? What are your best tips for tofu cooking? Oh my God, Laurie, tofu is almost <laughs> a book in itself. I mean, it's so much that you can do with tofu. I mean, right. I, mean, I love tofu. Oh my gosh. As, as you saw, you know, there, there's a whole chapter in, in dressings and sauces, right? So, right. We, that's a whole other thing we should talk about too, just real briefly dressing and sauces. You, as you, yeah. Exactly. So, as you saw in the immersion, you can do all kinds of dressings, oh. filler dressings, and you can make a, a bechamel for the lasagna that you had over there. So, mm. so, there's a lot that you can do with tofu on that side. Uh, but eating tofu as tofu, um, when you take it out of the, the the container, it tastes like absolutely nothing. It's just uh, I heard people say they like it. I can't believe it. Nobody can like that flavor. It, it tastes like nothing. 
<laughs> and, and, and so many times you see people take it out of the, the container and they put it on the grill and they mark it on one side and the other side and it still doesn't taste like anything. No. So what I do, and I actually did it uh, last night, I was, I was eating the leftovers today. Uh, I soak it in soy sauce. Uh, okay. overnight. Uh, not pure soy sauce is going to be way too salty. So you dilute the soy sauce, uh, maybe one to six. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And it really depends on how fast you're going to eat it. So if you're going to, if you're going to cook it in, within one hour, it has to be stronger. If you're mm. going to cook it the next day, it takes more time to soak in the flavors, then it could be a lighter um, dilution. So I soak it in soy sauce. And I, I happen to like garlic and lemon pepper. So that, that's what goes in the marinade. And it stays overnight in the tub. And next day, I just put it in the oven. Um, and two things happen. First, you get the flavor in uh, from the soy sauce. But you can do other things. If you like uh, barbecue, you can do barbecue. If you like uh, mustard, you can do mustard. It, it doesn't really matter what you put in there. Um, but it matters that you let it soak in that because the mm -hmm. tofu is dense. And if you don't let it soak in that flavor, if you just spread it on top, it still doesn't taste like anything inside. You're just gonna have a little bit of flavor on top and nothing in the inside. So, so marinade overnight is the best advice that I have for tofu. Um, and I, I like to bake, but you can fry. Um, but there's also a second thing that happens when you bake is the texture. You know, the tofu texture changes after you bake it because you make it denser and stronger. And if you let it cool completely, so if you don't eat right away, so if you fight, for example, I have to fight my wife because she starts biting. As, as soon as I take it out of the oven, she starts eating the tofu. No, 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 wait, 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 it gets better. So, so, so Marta, you know, so, so let, it, let it sit for a while because you're going to see that, uh, that it sets, you know, the, the texture sets better after it completely chills. Then you can heat again, mm. you can put it in a stew, you can put it in, uh, in the salad, you can put whatever you want. But... Um, Bake it and uh, again, 350, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Keep an eye on it. If it starts looking very dark, you may want to take it out um, <laughs> and, and let it set completely. Mm -hmm. and, and there are other things that you can do. You can do scramble. Um, same mm -hmm. deal. You got to give some time. So when you're cooking scramble, um, let it cook for a while. Even if you're doing it on a pot, do it at low heat. Let the tofu release the moist, the excess moist that it has in it. It gets into a different texture. It, it, it absorbs the flavor that you're cooking in the, in the scrambles. So if you're cooking scrambles with onions and garlic, uh, the tofu is going to absorb some of those flavors. Um, you usually use turmeric and, and some uh, nutritional yeast in the scramble. So cook a little longer, let, let it get into the right texture. Um, and, and it's great. And look, you can do a quiche, you can do uh, there's so many things that you can do with tofu. It's really phenomenal. But it has to do with cooking long enough. And in the case of the quiche, you got to let it set. So mm -hmm. if, if you're having it for brunch on Sunday, you have to do it Saturday night. Because you have to, you have to bake the quiche and let it cool completely. The next day is going to be perfect when you're ready. Mm -hmm. OK, so you're saying so let's say a tofu scramble, which I feel is like one of the most easy entries into the tofu world if you're kind of yeah. new to this. Yeah. What would you marinate? What would you put in a marinade for well, the tofu? You, the scramble, you actually don't need to marinate because you're breaking it okay. down long enough. That you're breaking it down to small pieces, so the flavors are going to get in there. Right. Okay. The, the, the problem with the marinade is just because you have, the, even if it is big cubes, <clears throat> the flavor is not going to get right inside, you know. Mm. So the scramble, because you're breaking it down, what I would do, what I do is I start uh, roasting onions and peppers in the pan. So going, going back to the sequence, right? First thing you do is you preheat the pan. Okay. Um, while the pan is preheating, I cut the onion and I cut the peppers. I throw the peppers and onions in there. Um, and then I break, let, it, let it brown a little bit. Then I add down, I add the, 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 the tofu itself, just break it down by hand, just grab the whole chunk and just break it down. It doesn't have to be very, very small because it will continue to break down as you stir it. So break it down by hand. Um, then you can add your turmeric and your uh, nutritional yeast, a little bit of salt. Um, that is about enough flavor. Um, if you want to add other things, you may, and, you know, the other flavors that you like. Some people like to add dill, some people like to add uh, uh, parsley. Um, but, and then just let it cook slowly. 
you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't just brown the outside because there's still too much moist inside the tofu and it hasn't absorbed the flavors of the onions and the peppers that you're cooking. So cook it slowly, maybe 15 minutes or so at, at low heat. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you will see, you'll see that the texture is, is, is getting different and, and let it brown slowly. Mm. And I will definitely say the tofu scramble leftovers the next day are always better. It, it's, it's the texture. It, it, when it's, it sets differently, it's, that's, that's yeah. what happens to tofu. Huh. Tofu. <coughs> Who knew? Tofu. Yeah. Okay. I, get, we're, I know we're pushing in our hour, but I, there's just so much to talk about. And then talk about like sauces and dressings, right? Because you can have the same ingredients and you change the sauce and the dressing and it's just like a whole nother world that you've entered. What... How should we begin to working at sauces and dressings? And just tell me what what would how would we start? Like, what are your ingredients, your meat ingredients, or whatever it is? I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I mean, when when we learn to make dressings, like like the basic one is vinaigrette, right? So a, a traditional vinaigrette made with oil will have three parts of oil. Uh, sorry, three parts of uh, vinegar to one. No, it's the other way around. It's three parts of oil to one part of vinegar. It's really horrible okay. <laughs> in terms of oil. Yeah, right? that's a lot. Um, yeah. But still, it's very sour. So, so we're making dressings. Most of the dressings are a little more sour than the sauces. The sauces tend to be a little more balanced. So the salad dressings, you know, when we think of ranch and we think of uh, the, the vinaigrette, all of those are going to be a little more sour. Mm. So, so you can do a lot of things starting with, uh, with a piece of tofu or starting with a little bit of cashew um, and, um, and vinegar. Um, bit of salt, a little garlic, and, and maybe a couple of herbs. So if you're making mm. ranch, you're using parsley and dill. Um, but again, this, it's not a, a huge variety of ingredients that you need to start making sauces, right? So, mm. so you can start as simple as a piece of tofu, a little water, uh, garlic, dill, um, parsley, and maybe some Dijon mustard. Uh, and, 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 you, and you taste it. You, see, you, see if, you will see if, if it's getting where you want it to be. Um, mm. When you come to sauces, you know, cashew is so versatile. You, you can make so many sauces with cashew cream, um, tofu as well. Uh, I happen to like coconut milk. It's a little heavier on fat, but uh, so it's not something that you have every day. It's just very heavy. But I, I also like the, the flavor that coconut milk uh, brings to the dishes. Um, and then uh, those, when, when you add the, the tart component, the, the, the acidic component, you add a little less than you will add for a, uh, for a salad dressing. And mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, I mean, it, you don't have to go crazy, you know, paprika, garlic, you know, the, the, the basic ingredients are gonna give you a lot of options. Mm. So you just start with the base of cashew or tofu. And then if you had someone who was maybe sensitive to the vinegars, cause I've definitely seen, as you see so many patients over the years, you're like, I know, I, but I can't do the vinegar. It might be some, you know, a little yeah. too much. What would you use in place of the vinegar for oh, someone lemon, who's sensitive? Lemon and lime, yeah. Okay. Lemon and lemon juice. So that, that's something that I always have in my, in my fridge. I always have lemon juice and lime, the bottled one. Uh, mm. Just to keep it simple, I always have lemon juice and lime juice in the fridge. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Oh my goodness. Okay. I just want to get to the immersion too, like, because Kim and I, we had so much fun talking about it. So what was your favorite part of living with all these people and cooking for folks and watching your food heal people? I mean, it was just so fun. Uh, Laurie, I think for any cook, our realization comes from seeing people eat the food. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. We like people to eat what we cook. You know, we, mm. we, we don't cook just for the sake of cooking. We, we want to see that joy. And, and when we see those people, they came from diverse backgrounds, you know, a lot of them had had no exposure to whole foods plant-based. Uh, they probably didn't eat a lot of vegetables before. Mm -hmm. And when, when you see them embracing that, that lifestyle and, and that food with the enthusiasm, you know, the open-mindedness that, that they had, you know, trying all of those things and, and tasting all of those things that look so different to them. I mean, that, that was really fantastic, you know, the, how they embrace this thing. And now we see on, in, in the social media and Facebook that they're cooking the mm -hmm. food and the dishes that they saw. I mean, that is that is such a realization. And, and I'm sure it was the same for Kim. I mean, it, it makes us uh, so happy to see that. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, it was, uh, I think there was just such a, 
at the end of it, they were just so amazed at how quickly this food, literally people have been suffering for decades yeah. from diabetes and hypertension within 10 days. That's like a long vacation, just literally their entire lives changed. Like the energy, the mood, the uh, just everything changed. It was just so phenomenal. I mean, I see it all the time. This is what we're prescribing, but to see it yeah. in person, living with someone for all these times, I just... Uh, it was unbelievable that their enthusiasm when they realize, you know, I don't have to inject myself anymore. Right. You know? Oh my gosh. I don't have yes. to take those things anymore. My joints are not hurting mm -hmm. anymore. My toes are not hurting anymore. My cholesterol came down. My mm -hmm. um, blood pressure came down. I mean, those guys, uh, it was amazing to see that just the happiness in, mm -hmm. in having come to the discovery that they, mm. they, can, they can take control of their health through food. I mean, it was it really, it was amazing to watch, you know? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And you guys made it so enjoyable because you made such delicious food and you were so right there in the kitchen and everybody was able to watch and learn and ask questions. And I think there was such an advantage, like their lives will be forever changed and all that, you know, they, they touch like one of them is actually sharing with friends and getting other people. So now we get to, they get to be the, the instigator and see the ripple effect. I mean, how fun is that? It's just so cool. No, that, that was phenomenal. And, and I know it was a privilege for them to have that opportunity to be able to come to the kitchen and stay with us and, and learn from us, but they can do it. You know, other people can do that through mm -hmm. a lot of resources that they have online. They have uh, Kim's mm -hmm. videos. She has a, a whole lot of uh, recorded uh, videos on cooking her, her recipes and frankly you can find any recipe online these days so Absolutely. you know it, it, i know it's different when, when you are in immersion but, mm -hmm. but you can do it and when you see the results i mean i, I think they're going to stick with it Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So where can people learn more about you? Where can we find your cookbook? I got mine off Amazon. Is there other places that people can learn more about uh, your projects? And no, what you've the, done? The, the cookbook is in Amazon. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's the easiest plant based recipe book ever. And, it really um, is. That's the name of it. It's just pop shot or just look for Chef Fernando. That works. And, and, and you can look me up on Facebook. You can look for okay. Chef Fernando or Fernando Peralta on Facebook and I, you, you're probably going to find me. However, did you know there is another Chef Fernando really? spelled just like your Peralto in Denver and he is not plant-based. He's actually lives in Denver. Up. Oh yes. I saw him on us, you know, looking for if he had a page uh -huh. and different things. And uh, I was like, what is this? Cause it didn't look like he was like, he had like some very different ideas about food, but it is Fernando Peralta, Chef Fernando Peralta. Oh, and he's like so bacon we're, and- We're gonna yeah. have to find my uh, Facebook handle <laughs> to put it in the corner. <laughs> So very good. Well, guys, I would highly encourage you to get the easiest plant-based recipe book ever. And um, I'm hoping that uh, this was helpful for you. I know it was helpful for me because you brought me back potatoes. So I can't thank you enough. And, <laughs> um, and you know, as I always like to close the shows by asking a question about what is the one piece of advice that you would give to someone who's just entering into this world and curious, plant curious, what would be something you'd help them make this transition? Uh, look, keep it simple, really. I mean, don't, don't try to make the most complicated recipes you come across, you know, exotic things, because it's discouraging. And, and it, it, as is discouraging when you start talking about this thing from, a, from a, what you can't eat, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not about what you can't eat. This is about what you can't. And the diversity of vegetables that you're going to find is so much greater than diversity of meats. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know. um, but, but really, keep it simple. Uh, go for the easier recipes. Uh, you know, don't, don't make it too much of a burden because it really isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be challenging when you're on the road. It's a little more complicated. And I guess you have a, probably another podcast on that. But uh, <laughs> uh, keep it simple in the kitchen. Uh, lots of fruit and vegetables that, that you can eat, the, the ones that you like. And uh, mm -hmm. keep a basic pantry and and look don't don't go for the crazy recipes because they leave those for um, for Thanksgiving. Yes. Oh, you know, and I think that's really important. And I feel like that's advice a lot of people share is keep it simple and don't be afraid to fail. Nobody's yeah. judging you. It's just food. Just yeah. try again. It'll it be it'll be us. okay. Laurie happens to every chef. Every now and then we make something. That, oh no, that didn't turn out well at all. <laughs> 
especially if you're cooking for families. I don't know if I ever shared with you, but when I started eating, you know, I, I cooked always, but I had to up my game, but the kids, I allowed them to give me thumbs up, thumbs down, or eh, when we first transitioned, just so they'd have, I would have feedback, but also give them a little like freedom to share judgment, but not in a respectful manner. And it was really fun. A lot of times I got this, but I was like, oh yeah, this next meal. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to go back for seconds and I'll know I got a thumbs up on that. So <laughs> that's my own personal challenge. Oh my gosh. But now when I, when they go back for second or even thirds, I was like, yes, that's the one to keep on the books, but keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Fernando. It's such a delight to talk to you as always. And um, I, I really do encourage people to get this, uh, the cookbook. I, I don't think you'll be disappointed because Chef Fernando's very talented. I will attest to that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lori. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button. So you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos on Monday, we upload the healthy human revolution podcast. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find it on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. Now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.